Hello everyone and welcome to Live at Five. I'm Kevin Adkisson, curator with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. And today we are coming to you live from the Frank Lloyd Wright designed Smith House. And it's good to see family joining us first. Hello to my sister Haley. Hello Jennifer Smith, the granddaughter of uh, Melvin and Sarah Smith who built this house. And good to see so many other Cranbrook followers. I was over here working with two art students, a painter and a metalsmith who are busy creating new works of art to be installed here at the Smith House. Later this month, on March 28th, we are launching our virtual installation entitled Speculative Histories, um, where I have asked students at Cranbrook Academy of Art, so graduate students in art, to come up with new uh, works of art engaging with the history, the fantasy, uh, the nostalgia, the futurism of these houses. So some students are responding directly to the actual history, but other students are sort of inventing their own alternative stories and their own unique sort of uh, worlds. There are 67 artists who are participating across all three houses. And the students who were just here, one is responding to a, a story about Mr. Smith hanging his tea kettle in the fireplace. The other is picturing the house as a site of uh, uh, almost like graffiti using tiles on the brick. It's going to be very cool. It's very exciting. Um, and because I had to meet them over here so they could get some new measurements, uh, and that work will be installed at the end of the month, I thought... A broadcast about something. And as I was looking around thinking about what to talk about today, I decided that we will focus on Mrs. Smith's love of dried Ikebana. Um, and a sort of remarkable survivor in the Smith House collection is this dried floral arrangement. And I say remarkable because this piece appears in photographs of the Smith House as early as 1958. And it is just kind of amazing that here, many decades later, it is still in the house. And you might look at it and think, oh, an interesting dried weed arrangement. Uh, but I think Mrs. Smith is really tapping into two different trends that the Smiths were uh, passionate about. One was Frank Lloyd Wright's belief that dried floral and dried grasses of the prairie were the best way to uh, ornament your home. And so in Frank Lloyd Wright's own house, he would often display arrangements of prairie grasses that he would gather around Chicago or in the wilderness of Wisconsin. He would also uh, gather up sort of uh, budding trees and allow them to you know, snip off the arm and then they would blossom inside the house. And he was really thinking along the lines of Japanese ikebana, of the art of Japanese flower arranging. And so Mrs. Smith is participating in Frank Lloyd Wright's love of dried flowers and dried grasses, but also in Frank Lloyd Wright's love of Japan, which the Smiths learned to share. And what's cool about this one surviving is that there were actually dried flower arrangements and later plastic flower arrangements in many of the vases around the house. This is the only one that survives with dried floral, and I don't know plants well enough to speculate on what any of these are. Um, but it is a combination of things we generally don't want in museums, um, but has been here long enough that it certainly isn't harboring any um, pest from the outside. And one of those are seed pods. And so you can see the seed pods have opened up and some of them fall into the base. And then she's also used these interesting sort of spears. I, I think those also must be seed pods growing on the stalk. Uh, and then there is this really funky dried set to two of the similar plants um, that come up in this wavy form. Now, behind it is a quite impressive tray by Ralph T. Abernathy, um, or excuse me, J.T. Abernathy, Ralph Abernathy, former mayor of Atlanta. Uh, no, J.T. Abernathy, who is a Cranbrook alum. And this 
combination of the dried ikebana and this beautiful ceramic tray or plate uh, has been here for many decades. It's one of the longest arrangements, groupings of objects that were here in the house. And when we look around, we can actually see that many of the other pieces had been used for plant arrangements. And so you can see here some of the floral foam that as the curator, I just don't want to scour any of these ceramics. But um, one day you could remove the evidence of the floral foam. But uh, Mrs. Smith did use a lot of these vessels for arrangements. And when she was arranging, Mrs. Smith could study from her Japanese friends and from the many students who were exchange students who came to the house. But then she also had books about Ikebana. And so the art of Japanese flower arranging is all about using uh, natural materials, using uh, flowers in very, um, if not minimalist, in very selective arrangements so that you're uh, sort of complementing geometries, like here in the Rika style, where you have a large saline triangle, uh, or really celebrating the individual aspect of a stem or flower. And so you're not so much overpowering with volume or with amount, but you're celebrating the sort of individual angles of each stem and branch. And here, as I look at some of the titles, we see the different styles like Sika, um, where, again, there's only sort of three elements in the arrangement. And it's all about celebrating what you have uh, on hand and what that individual plant specimen or flower is doing. And so Mrs. Smith, who this is a book from the Smith House Library, uh, she could study what kind of trays to use, she could study what kind of materials to use, um, learn how to stress lines, planes, or masses. Um, and then she could turn around uh, and having learned all of the sort of geometric and spiritual and uh, uh, plant lessons, she came back and she made her dried Ikebana arrangements. Now, I am attributing this to Mrs. Smith, but it is possible someone else made it for her, so I don't know for sure if this dried Ikebana is from the hand of Mrs. Smith, uh, but I will say it is a likely attribution um, just based on, on knowing her, reading about her, uh, knowing so much about the house. I, I do think that she made that little Ikebana piece. I thought it would be fun to head around the house, and we've done uh, Live at Five before where we have looked at other Japanese objects, um, like this really exquisite uh, tea kettle that one of our Japanese board members, Masumihira, told me was likely made for the Japanese export market, um, that it was likely made for sale here in the West. Uh, but there are all of these really exquisite Japanese items, including reproduction ceramics from Frank Lloyd Wright's Imperial Hotel in Japan. And if you really want to learn about Frank Lloyd Wright in Japan, there's a wonderful book on the subject with Frank Lloyd Wright in Japan in the title. But I also gave a lecture in the fall about Frank Lloyd Wright in Japan, uh, and you can purchase that on the center's website. There's a series of dolls from the very uh, southernmost island of Japan, a specific type of theater actress dolls. But then there are more of these Ikebana arrangements. And now... These are permanent botanicals, or plastic flowers, uh, and when you first look at it, you might just think, okay, well, this is just a plastic plant. But when you get more closely, you see some of the detailing that went into sort of bringing out the dry grasses across the stem, and then the overall arrangement of the flowers. I do think that though this piece has probably suffered some in moving around the house, uh, it, it is part of Mrs. Smith's Ikebana uh, practice. There's also uh, sculptures that begin to take on even the same sort of Ikebana lines. And as I move through the house, we're going to see a number of these permanent botanical Ikebana arrangements, including here in the master bedroom where we have these slightly worse for wear, um, uh, 
orchid flowers and whatever material that was here that is uh, pretty sun damaged. Um, but again, this artful arrangement in the vessel of the flowers. Elsewhere in the master bedroom, and why I really do attribute that dried arrangement to Sarah Smith is because there's just so many of these funny uh, works. I, I, mean, I find it just utterly charming. Um, so here we have an arrangement made up of another type of uh, seed pod, or I'm not sure what element of a plant this is. Um, this is a dry plant here, and then these are plastic flowers here. And then our last one in this room is actually in a uh, Ikebana vase, so this long um, Japanese vessel that would be used for living Ikebana or dried Ikebana. Mrs. Smith has again done a combination of driftwood, which she used throughout the house as a decorative material, and then around the driftwood she's brought in the plastic flowers, uh, and she's arranged them again, I think, using her Ikebana book there in the living room. Uh, she has it arranged artfully in this sort of Ikebana style. Now, if you have questions, be sure to type them in. Um, the permanent botanicals is a term that I learned in graduate school at the Winter program in the University of Delaware. Uh, and I accidentally said that it was a fake fern and the head of the program said, Kevin, that is a permanent botanical. And I hardly knew her at that point. And I thought, oh my gosh, what a weird term, how embarrassed. And then she just burst out laughing. So it's a great term, but it is, you have to be sort of self-aware to use it. There are a couple other um, permanent botanical ikebanas that I'll pull or, or I'll draw our attention to, but I wanted to point out the use of driftwood in the house, which I think really beautifully calls out between the bird's eye maple uh, plywood of the kitchen cabinet to then the tidewater red cypress of the window frame to then have this natural um, uh, driftwood piece pointing up towards another arrangement of dried plant life here. Now, some of you are at my plywood lecture on Friday, and so since you all joined me for that, I thought I would show you that the cabinets are all made of plywood, and they are um, five ply with a large center ply, and then the edges are bird's eye maple that has been unraveled, unspooled off the log, and to keep this plywood in tip-top shape from warping, Frank Lloyd Wright uses the piano hinge, so it holds it rigid on one edge. Let's see, I think our last Ikebana pieces are back here. There is a red flower version here. If this is your first Live at Five in the Frank Lloyd Wright Smith House, do I encourage you to scroll back in time or to sign up for one of our tours that will start in May. Um, I have done live virtual tours on Instagram and Facebook, touring the house, talking about who the Smiths were, how they built this house, how it was their dream. So you can scroll back and find tours that are more about the Smiths and the house. And then we are opening up uh, on May, the first weekend in May, for more tours in the house. Today we're just focusing on Mrs. Smith's uh, Ikebana practice. So this one is an, another vase that is a Japanese style Ikebana vase, so it's the appropriate form for fitting in, again, an arrangement of driftwood and then permanent botanicals. I'm not sure this one ever got vacuum, so another project for spring cleaning. Uh, I have lovingly cleaned many of these pieces using tiny horsehair brushes and a vacuum cleaner, and you dust off each leaf into the vacuum. It's a lot of labor for a lot of reward. So then our last pieces are in here, and look at this light coming in through the clear story and going across uh, towards our most carrot-like permanent botanical. Um, I'm not sure exactly what plant this is supposed to be, but again, it has been lovingly arranged by Mrs. Smith into this uh, Ikebana form. And so you have these large orange plastic wrapped fabric stems uh, leading to these orchids and so arranged as to be reaching towards the light. And 
this piece was in this room. Um, I'm not sure what direction it was. I definitely turned it so that this effect would happen. But based on historic photographs, I think that is how the Smiths had it. So it is a fun interaction with the clear story windows that are coming in, running above the hallway, uh, and running over the closet of this room to then hit the Ikebana piece. And of course, a wonderful uh, oil or acrylic painting by Robert Smith, Bobby Smith, the Smith's son, and Jennifer's father. And I think Jennifer's watching with us today. So elsewhere in the house, there are more permanent botanicals that are not arranged into Ikebana. So uh, there are these cool, large ceramic vases uh, that are just sort of fake um, rhododendron are stuck in. And then there is this corner, which has the uh, hanging plant. What's interesting is this is a real planter. And so when this room was enclosed in 1968, the former wall was right here. Uh, it was expanded by Frank Lloyd Wright's apprentice, William Wesley Peters. The Smiths actually grew um, uh, sort of large fiddlehead plants here. And they eventually grew out towards the ceiling. So we have pictures of this really looking like a greenhouse. And I've always wondered what was the moment where Mr. Smith, who was such a dedicated landscaper and gardener, um, sort of looked at his interior plants and thought, I'm going to get those out of here and put in plastic. Uh, because it, it happens in the 70s. So Mr. Smith did it. It wasn't something that happened after his passing. Um, but we are lucky to have the original permanent botanicals here in the house. And now that we have the UV protective film, I imagine that the fading, which in some of them is pretty extreme, uh, the fading will stop. So I started today's Live at Five mentioning the upcoming Speculative Histories show that I am curating with 67 students from Cranbrook Academy of Art. One of those students um, working as a team of two of the photography students are actually doing a project where they are reinterpreting the uh, permanent botanicals in a sort of queer fantasy. And so they have actually um, uh, will be replacing this planter and then uh, intermingling among some of these objects, some uh, in the tradition of Mrs. Smith, more wild sort of multicolor fluorescent permanent botanicals. Uh, I gave a, series, a lecture for the students that introduced each house and introduced some of these stories, and now they are coming back and they are going to be installing new work alongside the Smiths collection to, I think, expand the conversation, continue the conversation uh, in a way that I hope would make the Smiths very proud. They were, of course, dedicated supporters and investors in the artist at Cranbrook. And so um, I hope that they enjoy some of the new work. The student who just left is creating little um, sort of hand hammered metal figures. Uh, she saw in this teapot the, the figure of a body. And the story of this is it's a Japanese tea kettle uh, that is meant to sit on a tatami mat. So it's meant to actually sit on the ground here. Mr. Smith rigged it up in a historically incorrect manner, uh, more as like a kettle. And the student found this pretty funny and pretty inspiring. And so she is going to make a series of copper pieces that will sort of fly through the, the chimney as they form their own sort of spirits raising up from the ground and flying out with this being the sort of uh, demigod of the fireplace. I hope that all the students uh, create work that is as inspired and as uh, engaging with the histories of these houses. Sign up for that event online now. It is going to be a free lecture, but there's an opportunity to uh, add a donation to help support the work of the Cranbrook Center while you buy your ticket. If you want to find the link to that, just Google Speculative Histories Cranbrook, and you can sign up for that lecture at 3 o'clock on March 28th, where I will go through photographs of all of the student work. There's not going to be an in-person component. We're not there yet. Um, so, so we'll install the work and have it professionally photographed and it will live on in a virtual gallery and I'll do a virtual talk. So I hope you enjoyed this look at some of the permanent botanicals here at 
uh, the Smith house. They, they come down from the ceiling much like they did in Frank Lloyd Wright's drawings. And there is uh, one living plant in the house that has been here since the Smith's time. And that is my lone cactus, who unfortunately the UV film is likely going to cause the um, uh, uh, doom of the cactus. Uh, though there are still green parts, but he can't actually get nourishment from the sun anymore. So we'll appreciate him while he lasts, and then we'll figure out what to do next. But the UV film was an absolute necessity for the survival of the rest of the house and all of its textiles and objects. Um, and luckily for us, the Smiths had already changed out most of the plants to permanent versions. I hope you enjoyed today's talk. I'll be back tomorrow on Facebook Live at 5 o'clock, and then next week here on Instagram, Tuesday at 5 o'clock. Until then, have a great afternoon. Enjoy this spring-like weather in the middle of March. Enjoy this beautiful light, and I will see you next time. Don't forget to sign up for the Speculative Histories virtual exhibit and lecture on March 28th. Bye, everyone. Maybe goodbye. We could just stay here forever. There it goes. Ta-ta-ta.